Hey there, here we are in West Virginia. Uh, maybe not. Anyways, I'm ready for joke of the day, are you? Let's have it. So what do you call Santa when he stops moving? Well, Santa pause. <laughs> okay, so let's pause for a second so we can get into our lesson. So you can see that what we're going to be looking at today is organizing and visualizing data. And we're going to first take a look at the idea of what statistics is. Statistics is gathering, organizing, analyzing, and making predictions from numerical information. So in other words, take for instance what's happening now with COVID-19 and the C CCD and the World Health Organization, they are gathering information. They are taking that information and organizing it into tables and graphs and charts. From those tables, graphs, and charts, they are analyzing the data, and the analyzation of that data is allowing them to make predictions of where we can expect things to go from here. All of this coming from numerical data. This is statistics. So within statistics, we've got some terminology that we need to understand, one being that the data the data is the numerical information that is gathered. The other definition that we need is a population. The population is every individual of interest. So in other words, say for instance with our COVID-19 situation, every individual of interest would be every single person across the globe, every single person in the entire world. Now sometimes it's very difficult to poll every single person in the entire world, so sometimes we can only take a sampling of our population, and that is what we call a sample. So the sample is only some of the individuals of interest. So in other words, if we would love to poll every single person across the globe, but that's not possible, then perhaps what we would like to do is take a sampling. In other words, some people in um, the European nations, some people in the Asian nations, some people in the African nations, and some people in the Americas. And that would give us a sample of all of our individuals of interest. However, sometimes when we gather that sample, sometimes we create what's called bias. Bias is when our sample does not accurately reflect the population as a whole with regard to the data being gathered. So in other words, if for instance, I want to see how COVID-19 is, um, is progressing throughout the world, and I only sample, say for instance, just the people in China where it began, um, then what would happen is we would get a biased sampling here because we, it's already spread throughout China, it's already on its way out in China, and so the data we would gather there would be very skewed and we would have bias in there. Another example of bias, say for instance, would be what if I was looking at um, possibly musical interests across the US? And say instead of sampling all the people in the US, I only sample, say, just the people in West Virginia. Well, if I only sample the people in West Virginia, then there's a darn good chance, because a lot of the folks in West Virginia like country music, then there's a darn good chance that I'm not gonna get an accurate representation of the musical interests of all the people in the US. I might just get a whole bunch of country music lovers. And so therefore, I have created bias in my information and in my data. So it's very important that when you gather your sample, you do a random sampling. And therefore, you gather um, just a random sampling of the people or the, the um, population that you're interested in. Well, now that we understand that terminology and now that we understand how to gather the information, let's take a look at how to organize the information once it has been gathered. There are several ways to organize that data, and one of the ways is what we call a frequency distribution, also called a frequency table. Your frequency table, or your frequency distribution, is simply a list of the data and their frequencies. So I've got an example here, and what I did in, in my class one semester was I said, let's make a frequency distribution of all the majors that are in this class. So what I said was, tell me all the different majors that you are in in this class. Some people said that they were political science majors, and some people said that they were communications majors. 
Some people said that they were elementary education majors. Some people said that they were business majors. And then I had one little fellow who said he was undecided and just not quite sure what he wanted to major in. So here were all the different majors that were in that class. So what we did at that point was I simply said, okay, raise your hand if you're a political science major. And then I tallied them all up. And I put tick marks to represent everybody that I was counting who said with their hands raised, yes, they were political science majors. And I came up with 14 students who were poli-sci majors. Then I said, raise your hand if you're a communications major. And I had two students who raised their hands and said, yes, I'm a communications major. And then I said, raise your hand if you're an elementary education major. And then I started counting them and putting tick marks here, hash marks, whoops, to show how many of them were elementary education majors. And that is absolutely wrong. There were nine of them who were elementary education majors. And then I said, raise your hand if you're a business major. There were two of them. And then I said undecided, and there was my one fellow who said he was an undecided major. That gave me a total of all the students who were in the class, and I double-checked that and found, yes, there were 28 students who were in that class that day. So this gave me a frequency distribution of all the majors in the class. Now, when you make a frequency distribution, you do not have to show the tick marks that are there. All you have to do is simply list these frequencies to show that you've got your frequency distribution. You do not always have to list your total down here. I like to list it just to make sure that I have a quick glance and just one quick glance at it and I know what my total is. But this is what a frequency distribution looks like. Just simply shows the frequency of times that that piece of data shows up. Now there is another way to organize your data and it's what we call a relative frequency distribution. A relative frequency distribution is similar to the frequency distribution. However, the term relative is, or the word relative is very important here because it says relative to the total that's there, how often does this show up? In other words, how many times out of the total does this piece of data show up? So therefore, it shows the percent of time each item occurs. Again, the idea is relative to the total, how often does this show up? So to make a relative frequency distribution, say for instance, for the majors in the class, we would say, okay, what were those majors? Remember we had political science, we had communications, We had elementary education. We had business. And we had our undecided major. So to make your relative frequency distribution or relative frequency table, again, what we're saying here is out of the total, how often does this show up? So I had 14 of those political science majors, but that was 14 out of the 28, which if you turn that into a decimal, basically that's half the time. That's 0.5. Now we said there were two communications majors, so two out of the 28 total were communications majors. And if you turn that into a decimal, you get 0 0.07. And if we took our elementary education majors and we said, okay, there were nine of them, nine out of 28, then that gives us a decimal value of 0 0.32. And we said with that business majors, there were two of them out of 28. And yet again, two out of 28 gives us 0 0.07. And then my undecided major, one out of 28, gives us a decimal value of 0 0.04. So if we then, if we then would turn these into percentages, because like I said, now a relative frequency distribution, this is all you need. 
you said, and typically you listed in decimal values, although sometimes you list it with these fractions. But just to get an idea of what this means, recall that 0.5 is, a, is, well, it's exactly 50%. 0 0.07 is about 7%. Well, it's exactly 7%, but honestly, this is 0 0.0714, to be completely honest with you. Um, so I've rounded it to 0 0.07, so it'd be about 7%. 0 0.32, in other words, that was 9 divided by 28. And again, that's rounded as well because it's 0 0.3214. So in a decimal value, it's about 32, or not decimal value, I'm sorry, but percent value. It's about 32%, again, about 7% and about 4% here. If we total these, it should total 100%, but again, these were rounded values, so it's not quite gonna total 100%. This actually totals to be um, 50 plus seven plus 32 plus seven plus four. Well, it is 100%, how about that? I stand corrected. Um, anyways, this is what your relative frequency distribution looks like. Again, you do not have to list these percentages. Um, you just simply list your fractions and or your decimal values. And you can see the difference between the frequency distribution here and the relative frequency distribution here is simply the idea of the word relative. Relative simply meaning I'm asking out of out of the total, how many times does this show up? Let's see if I can get it to focus better. There we go. Out of my total, how many times does this show up? And that's your relative frequency distribution. Again, as I said, as opposed to your frequency distribution, which simply says, how many times does that data show up? So these are two ways to organize your data with your frequency distribution and your relative frequency distribution. Now, these are individual pieces of data. So I had individual major of uh, political science, individual major of communications, elementary education, business, and undecided. However, there are times when you have so much data that it needs to be grouped because with this much data, it's too difficult to list each individual piece of data. My table would be enormous and that would be very overwhelming. So instead, sometimes we need to group our data into classes. And we make our frequency distribution and our relative frequency distribution based on those classes. So what I have listed here is um, the number of bases stolen by a team or perhaps uh, by an individual, but probably by a team, I'm not a baseball player, so I'm not very good at this concept, but I can certainly do the statistics that's involved in it. So we'll say that this first group of data is for the home games and we'll say that the second group of data is for our away games. And what I want to do is group them into classes, like I said. Now, if you look at all the data that's here, you can see that, say for instance, um, I see single digit numbers, and those sing single digit numbers, I could group as a class of zero to nine stolen bases. And then I see a bunch of numbers that are in the teens. So I could say, okay, that's a class of 10 to 19, my teens. I see a bunch of numbers that are in the 20s. So I have a class from 20 to 29. And I also notice that I've got some numbers in the 30s. So I've got classes from 30 to 39, and then I've got classes that are in the 40s, 40 to 49. So if I'm gonna make my frequency distribution, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, let's go back and look. How many pieces of data were in the single digits? Well, I've got one here, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven pieces of data, seven um, times the stolen bases were in the single digits. Now I'm gonna look at the ones that are in the teens. I've got one here, two here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. 14 times 
Num the bases were stolen in the teens. And now let's look at our 20s. So we've got, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times bases were stolen in the 20s. Now let's look at our 30s. So we've got one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, seven times bases were stolen in the 30s. And now finally in those 40s, we've got one, two, three, four, five times bases were stolen in the 40s. So if we were to make a frequency distribution for the bases stolen, this is all that we would need. Um, and we can see that we have, we, let's check to make sure that our total is 40, as we are told. 21 and 8 is 28, 28 and 7 is 35, 35 and 5, yes, is 40. So we do have the correct number of, of, of pieces of data listed there. Now remember, relative frequency means relative to the total, how many times does this data show up? We have a total of 40, so that means 7 out of 40 times bases were stolen in the single digits. And that gives us a, um, a decimal value of, let's see here, seven divided by 40 is, we're gonna round, well, 0 0.175, we won't round. And so that means in the teens, this is 14 out of 40. And so 14 out of 40 is 0 0.35. And now we're going to look at, once again, 7 out of 40. 7 out of 40 is, once again, 0 0.175. And here again, 7 out of 40 being 0 0.175. And then finally, 5 out of 40. And 5 out of 40 is 0 0.125. Now, as far as where to round, that depends on the directions that you're given. Oftentimes, we round to the hundredths, so this would be about 0 0.18, 0 0.18, 0 0.18, 0 0.13. But these are coming up exact here in the hundred spot, so I'm going to leave them in the hundredths. And again, so what should happen here is this would be 17.5%. This would be 35%, and once again, 17.5%, 17.5%, and a 12.5%. And sure enough, all of these total to my 100%. So 17.5% of the time, bases were stolen in the single digits, as, and that's the case for the 20s and the 30s. 12.5% of the time, bases were stolen in the 40s, and 35% of the time, bases were stolen in the teens. So like I said, if you were asked to give a relative frequency distribution relative to the total, this is how the data showed up. And that, again, is the difference between a relative frequency and a frequency distribution. So this is the third way, or sorry, the second way that you can display your data with frequency distributions or relative frequency distributions. Now let's take a look at another way to organize, and well, that was ways to organize the data. Let's look at ways to display the data. One way to display the data is with a bar graph. Your bar graph, what it does, as you can see, is you have a graph here, and you're going to put bars on the graph. So you need to organize your horizontal axis down here and your vertical axis here. So we put our classes on the horizontal axis and we put our frequencies on the vertical axis. So in the case of the majors in the class, that means this horizontal axis is going to be those majors. So I will list my political science here. I will list my communications here. I will list my elementary education here. I will list my business here. And I will list my undecided here. So this horizontal axis is going to be the majors that are in the class.
Now, if this um, bar graph displays the frequency distribution, then that means on this axis, the vertical axis, this will be the frequencies themselves. Now, if we go back to our frequency table when it came to the majors in the class, notice that we had frequencies ranging from 1 to 14. So that means that when I list these frequencies here, I want to go as low as a 1 and as high as a 14. So perhaps so that I can get everything in here right, I'll go by twos. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and 14, so that I can show everything. But with a bar graph, I need to make sure that I leave spaces between the bars. Let me write that up here. Spaces between the bars, because that is very important. That will be a distinction between your bar graphs and your histogram that we're going to look at next. So when I do my political science and recall that there were 14 students who were political science majors, that means that I'm going to do a bar going all the way up to 14. And then oftentimes we just kind of color in that bar just so it stands out a little bit better. Now, my communications majors, remember there were two of them, so that means I'm going to draw a bar on communications only going up to two, and I'll shade that one in as well. Elementary education, there were nine of those, so therefore that means on my elementary education, I'll draw a bar that goes all the way up to nine, so halfway between the eight and the ten. So my elementary education will go up to here, and again, I'll color in that bar just so it stands out a little bit better. My business majors, there were two of them. So I'll draw a bar that goes up to two to the same height as my communications majors and color that in. And my undecided, remember there was one little guy who wasn't sure what he wanted to major in. So my undecided will go halfway up. And so this is what the bar graph will look like for the frequency distribution for the majors in the class. Now, you can make a bar graph for a relative frequency distribution. The only difference will be that instead of frequencies, we'll have relative frequencies over here. So that means on this horizontal axis, it will still list the data items themselves, political science, communications, elementary education, business, and undecided. And so I will label this as the majors that are in the class. And then along the vertical axis will be frequencies, but again, this time it's relative frequencies instead of frequencies themselves. And let's go back and look at our, our um, chart, our distribution that we had for relative frequencies. Here's that chart. And notice those relative frequencies went anything from a 0 0.04 all the way up to a 0.5. So I need to make sure that the marks that I make through here will display that information quite well. So let's say, for instance, I call this a 0.1 and this a 0.2. Here, 0.3. Make this a 0.4. And then right up here will be my 0.5. So when it goes to political science, recall political science was 0.5 relative frequency. So I'm going to make my bar for political science go all the way up to the 0.5. And I will shade that bar in just so that it stands out a little bit better. Communications, recall that communications was 0.07. So I'll make a bar that goes up to 0.07. Now that's not quite up to 0.1, it's 0.07. So here's 0 0.05, 0 0.07 will be a little bit beyond halfway between those two, or a little bit under halfway, that is. So my 0 0.07 will look right here. But again, this is a bar graph, so therefore I want spaces between the bars. Now my elementary education was 0.32, so that means that I'm going to go up to 0.3 and just a little bit past that. Here's 0.35. So 0.32 will be just a little bit beyond. And so here is my bar for elementary education. Now business, once again, business was 0.07. So that means that my bar for business is going to go up just like my communications did up to 
And then finally, my, my lone undecided major was 0 0.04. So once again, that's not 0.4, that's 0 0.04. Well, here's 0 0.05, so it's a little bit under that, going up to about here. And there's undecided. Hopefully you're noticing that as you compare the frequency bar graph to the relative frequency bar graph, the shapes are the same. The highest here is the poli sci, dipping very low for communications, back up for elementary ed, down to business, business and communications both have the same height, and dipping down again for undecided. So they should have the same shape, but these are based on relative frequencies, Relative to the total, how often do they show up? That's a decimal value or perhaps a percentage or even a fraction. And here it's strictly the frequencies. How often do they show up? Now, there is another way to display this information. It's very, very similar to our bar graph, and it's called a histogram. Your histogram, like I said, is like that bar graph. But the difference is there are no spaces between those bars. So therefore, the labeling of the axes will be the same. In other words, that horizontal axis will still show the classes and the vertical axis will still show the frequencies or the relative frequencies. But your histogram is often used when you're graphing groups of classes instead of individual um, pieces of data. Graphing groups of classes. So let's take a look at that stolen basis um, that we, we did a relative frequency table and a, dist and a frequency table for, and let's make a histogram for those. Now remember, histogram, there's going to be no spaces between the bars, but the axes are going to be labeled the same. In other words, the vertical axis will still be the frequency or the relative frequency. This one does not say relative frequency. It just simply says frequency. So my vertical axis will be the frequencies of the times that those bases were stolen, and my horizontal axis will be those classes. Now, again, this one, there's no spaces between the bars. So my first class was 0 to 9. My second class was 10 to 19. My second class was in the 20s, 20 to 29. My third class was in the 30s, 30 to 39. And my last class was in the 40s, 40 to 49. And so again, this axis is showing me the number of bases stolen or stolen bases. Number of stolen bases. So let's go back and let's look at that information that we had about stolen bases. And in our frequency distribution, the single digits were a frequency of seven, and it went as low as a five all the way up to a 14. So that means that when I make these frequencies, maybe what I want to do is let's try listing them in twos again. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and 16 all the way up to here. So my single digit bases, there were seven times the bases were stolen in the single digits. So my single digits will go up to seven. That's halfway between the six and the eight. And again, I'll shade the bar so that it stands out a little bit better. In my teens, there were 14 times that bases were stolen in the teens. So that would go all the way up to 14 here. And I'll shade that bar so that it stands out a little bit better. And in my 20s, there were seven times, and the same thing for the 30s, seven times for each of those bases that were stolen. So just like in my um, single digits, my 20s and my 30s will have the same height on the bar. And then finally in the 40s, five times that the bases were stolen in the 40s. So that's halfway between the four and the five. So this is what my histogram will look like for bases stolen. And again, hopefully what you're seeing here is that the difference between a bar graph and a histogram, histogram has no spaces, no spaces, bar graph has spaces between the bars. Now let's take a look at the last way that we can organize our data, and this is what we call a stem and leaf display. What happens with your stem and leaf display is it presents the two sets of data side by side. And it takes a two-digit number and it breaks it into parts. 
So if I have a 34, the 34 is broken into two parts. The 10 spot is what we call the stem, and the ones digit is what we call the leaf. And so it allows us to display that data based on the stem, based on the leaf. So let's go back to our stolen bases. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna display all of these stolen bases in that stem and leaf plot. So notice that we had everything, um, and we're gonna separate them out based on the home games and the away games. And notice that the distribution that we had, we had in the single digits, in the teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. So that means all of our stems will go zero, one, two, three, and four. Zero because our single digits, we need to have, we, we need to have it in a two digit display. So anything that's a single digit will be like a zero one, zero two, zero three, zero six, and so on and so forth. So if we look at, and these will be all the stems along this part, and then we'll list our leaves or our leaves along this part. So this is how your stem and leaf display works. Let's go back and look at those home games. So in those home games, our single digits, the smallest one we had was a, a three. I'm gonna look at that as a zero three. So therefore my stem is zero, my leaf is three. So I'll list three this way, zero, three. Now my next um, single digit number is a six. So now I'm gonna list that as zero, six. So I'll list it as zero, six for the six. And then finally, the last of our single digits is our seven that's right here. And so that's gonna be listed as a zero, seven. So I'll list it as zero, seven. Now let's take a look at our teens. We have an 11 and we have one, two of those 11s. And let's scratch these out of here. I don't need these anymore and it's just gonna be very cluttered. So I'm gonna scratch them out after I've used them. So now I've got an 11 here and 11 here. So that gives me a stem of one and a leaf of one. So here I've got a stem of one and a leaf of one. That means this equates an 11. But I have two of those, so I'm gonna list a second one this way. This equates as an 11. So I have an 11 here, and then I have an 11 here. I'm gonna scratch these out because they're no longer necessary. The next one that I've got is a 13 right here. So that'll be a one on my stem and a three on my leaf. Next, we have a 14, so it'll be a one on the stem, four on the leaf, and then I have a couple of 15s. Again, a one on the stem, five on the leaf, but I have two of them, so I need to list those fives twice. So let's scratch out the 15 here and scratch out the 15 here. Now we've got 17, seven, three of these 17s, so I need to list them three times in my stem and leaf plot. So that's a one on the stem, seven on the leaf, another one on the stem, seven on the leaf, another one on the stem, seven on the leaf. So I'm gonna scratch those out because I don't need them anymore. And now we're moving on to the 20s. So I've got a 22, that'll be a two on the stem, two on the leaf, and then I've got a 24, two on the stem, four on the leaf, and then I've got a 27. Once again, two on the stem, seven on the leaf. And now I'm gonna list in the 30s. So the smallest of the 30s that I have is this 31, three on the, uh, on this, oh, let me scratch out my 27, I apologize. Three on the stem, one on the leaf, and then I have a 32, three on the stem, two on the leaf, and then I have a 34, three on the stem, four on the leaf. And then I have a 37, three on the stem, seven on the leaf. And then finally, let's take a look at our 40s. We only have the 42, so that's a four on the stem, two on the leaf. So this is what the stem and leaf display will look like for those home games. Now let's create a stem and leaf display for our away games. It'll be the same process. I range from single digits all the way up to in the 40s. So there's all the stems. Now we're gonna deal with the leaves. So in those single digits, I start with a four, 
And so this is listed as a 0, 4, but I have a second one here, 0, 4, so I'll list it twice. And I'm going to scratch those out so I don't clutter myself up. And now I see a 7, so that's listed as a 0, 7, so 0, 7. And then I've got a 9, which is listed as a 0, 9. That's all of my single digits. Now let's look at the teens. We have an 11 here, that's one in the stem, one in the leaf. We have a 15 here, that's one in the stem, five in the leaf. We have a 16 here, one in the stem, six in the leaf. We have an 18, which is a one in the stem, eight in the leaf. And then finally we have a 19, one in the stem, nine in the leaf. And that's all of our teens. Now let's take a look at our 20s. We have four of these 27s, and that's all we have in the 20s. So two in the stem, seven in the leaf. And we'll do that four times because we have four of those 27s. Now let's take a look at our 30s. So we have a 30 itself, which is three in the stem, zero in the leaf. And we have two 33s, so we'll list them twice. Three in the stem, three in the leaf, three in the stem, three in the leaf. And now finally in our 40s. And we have a 41, four in the stem, one in the leaf. 42 is four in the stem, two in the leaf. 43 is four in the stem, three in the leaf. And finally our 44 is four in the stem, four in the leaf. And that's what our stem and leaf display will look like for the away games. So hopefully you can see that we've got four different ways to organize and display our data. The first way is with our frequency distribution that says, let's just say how frequently the data shows up. And this is most commonly used whenever we have, um, whenever we've got individual pieces of data. We've got our relative frequency distribution that simply says relative to Relative to the total, how often does it show up? So that's our relative frequency distribution. However, we can organize both of these into classes whenever we've got entirely too much data to list it individually. And we can make our classes and do a frequency distribution. And we can do a relative frequency distribution with those same ideas, with the same definitions in mind. We can organize them into bar graphs and histograms. Bar graphs, notice that we've got our, our classes or our pieces of data, the, the, uh, the definitions of the data, the classes along that horizontal axis and along the vertical axis will be either the frequencies or the relative frequencies. The same thing will happen with your histograms. This horizontal axis will list the data and the vertical axis will list the frequencies or the relative frequencies. So therefore, the only difference between the two is that your bar graph has spaces between the bar and your histogram does not have spaces between the bar. And then finally, we've got our stem and leaf display, which lists your stem here, which is the, the uh, first part, first digit in your double digit number. And then the leaf will be the second digit in your double digit number. And so you list all your stems here and then your leaves out this way. So I hope that helps with the ways to organize and visualize your data. And I hope you have a great day. Bye.